afternoon to have with us today some people who know a little something, something about what it has been like for decades to be in this community. And what we're looking at is how do we have this community come back to being something that values the community first. I want to introduce Mr. Del Monte Jefferson, the executive director of the Center for Black Health and Equity. And it is their initiative always on the forefront of looking at health equity. What does that mean? What it means is what do we do to level the playing field of opportunities? And health touches every aspect of our life. And we've not had the privilege of having that be central in a way that is positive, forward thinking, and growing and honoring the people of those communities. What we know is around the country, there are too many communities of black and brown people that are underrepresented and underserved. And there have been actions since our landing here that have always served to work against us and not for us. In this climate, it's time for us to wake up to the reality of we are the ones that we have been waiting for. And it's about bridging our past to the present to lead us forward into a future. Delmani Jefferson is the executive director of the Center for Black Health and Equity. He's responsible for the strategic direction and oversight of an organization and our, he is the primary spokesperson because it was his vision long ago, what must we do? to make a difference in our communities. Before coming to the center, he worked as a public health program administrator. So he knows firsthand on the ground what it takes to move the needle towards better health for all. He has done this work in North Carolina, Louisiana, and Georgia, where he managed statewide tobacco control initiatives that I can attest to. Del Monte's been an integral part of the national movement to ban mentholated tobacco products, the poison that makes the tobacco go down so smoothly. He is nationally recognized as an expert in the field. He is skilled, a skilled collaborator across sections of public sector, government, private sector, entities, to create programs and services that promote health justice a word we all are familiar with, for communities that too often are marginalized and disenfranchised, the underserved and underrepresented. Del Monte resides in Atlanta, Georgia, with his wife and children. He loves spending time outdoors and is an avid golfer, and it takes a focus on health to make those things possible and viable. Please join me in welcoming Del Monte Jefferson. All right, well, I like to golf, but I'm not golfing right now. It's too hot outside. You know, I don't golf in 90 degree weather. Um, we thank you guys for being here again, as Helen said. I am an executive director of the Center for Black Health and Equity. We got one of our staff members here. Chelsea is there. She's the one taking your pictures and doing all that stuff going on. And so welcome, Chelsea. And I think some more coming, as I heard. Uh, this is one of our programs, uh, this program here. It works. It's funded through OMH, and it's looking at, you know, how do we get equity-centered policies in communities? How do we take care of issues that have been hurting our communities? Other programs that we run, as Helen said, we have tobacco programs that we run across the country, and we, and we work closely with um, the Heart Coalition and Nikki over here uh, in our tobacco work, aiming to ban the sale of mentholated tobacco products, which black people smoke. We know that, right? 85% of black people who smoke, smoke menthol. So we want to get menthol banned so that that 85% isn't smoking mentholated tobacco products. We've got food and nutrition programs that we run in Cleveland, and we were running one in Atlanta and New Orleans. And so we got food and nutrition programs. We've got COVID programs. We've got a wonderful um, truth check program that we've got. It's a web-based uh, social media kind of campaign, and it helps you to look at misinformation and disinformation 
related to COVID. But not just COVID, you can find misinformation and disinformation in other public health areas as well. You can find that in tobacco, you can find that in food and nutrition and cancer and HIV. So we, we love our Truth Check program, so we've got that that we operate as well. So we, we work to build capacity in communities, and so this is right up our alley. We're right in communities, we're working here. And, and what we want to do is we want our communities to have the knowledge and the information that they can so that they can advocate to other folks to get these policies changed. So that's what we do at the center. Uh, we've been very successful in it. We've been doing it since 2000, uh, June of 2000. We started as the National African American Tobacco Prevention Network, but we've grown. So I'm also here um, <clears throat> not just to represent the center, but also to introduce um, our, our next uh, speaker, um, which is Commissioner Hall. Um, Natalie Hall, she is a Fulton County Commissioner of District 4, and, um, and she is very passionate, of course, about making a positive impact on the lives of the citizens of Fulton County. She previously served Fulton County faithfully for six years as the Chief of Staff to the late Fulton County District Commissioner Joan Garner, who we all know and love and respect. So I'm going to let Commissioner Hall come up and say a few words before we get our program started. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm your Fulton County Commissioner of District 4, and that is very different from when I was first elected because we have been redistricted as of January of this year, and so now the district looks a whole lot different. It doesn't go all the way northwest of the Mercedes-Benz Stadium to Fulton Industrial Boulevard anymore, and it doesn't go all the way down to the Andrew and Walter Young YNCA on Campbellton Road anymore. It literally has shifted to the southeast side, so I have the airport and Hapeville College Park East Point and all the southeast side down to the Clayton County line, and it shifted northeast to the DeKalb County line and north of downtown Midtown up to uh, Virginia Highlands. So it is a very, it's still very unique, very diverse. I serve from the homeless to the very wealthy and uh, have about 90% of the Atlanta Beltline in it. So um, if you live anywhere inside of there, you are my resident, my constituent, and I'm here to serve you. But I want to thank you for inviting me to the Sweet Auburn Community Listening Campaign. I'm so happy that you all came out. Uh, to share your experiences with living in Atlanta before and after the I-7585 connector. Um, thank you in advance for contributing your perspectives to help facilitate equity-centered policy change. And I want to acknowledge the facilitators of this event, Dr. Helen Holton and Mary William Stover of the Center of, for Black Health and Equity. This Organization is a national nonprofit organization that facilitates public health programs and services that benefit communities and people of African descent. I'm so impressed by their research um, because it helps share our perspectives and our truths. I also want to thank the Auburn Avenue Research Library. Um, every time I step foot in here, I'm so proud of the renovations that we've made and the, the We've been, we're even digitizing Ambassador Andrew Young's papers here. So we're doing some great work in this library and I'm excited for all of you to get started. So again, I wanna thank you for inviting me here this afternoon and I want you to know that as your Fulton County Commissioner of District 4, what I do for you to serve you is not what I call hard work, I call it heart work. So thank you very much for allowing me to participate in this. And I must say, I have known Commissioner Hall for a number of years when she, like many of us, wanted to make a difference in community any way that we could. And so what we want to do now is we have a wonderful video, short video, to show what we're talking about, why this matters, and giving context. Like the Sankofa bird, sometimes it's important that we look backwards in order to regain perspective and insight 
in terms of what it will mean for us to move forward. What's possible? And that's what we're here to talk about today. So we're not going to do much more talking than what we've done because we're going to watch this video and then we're going to bring forward people from the community to tell us why this work is important. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Helen. Um, before we go to the video, I just want to um, provide just a few more uh, acknowledgements. If I could uh, acknowledge some of our other partners, uh, Meharry Medical College, and of course you've heard from Commissioner Hall. Uh, we also partnered uh, with Fulton County Senior Services and, as she mentioned, the Auburn Avenue Research Library. My name is Tanya Curitan Curry. I'm a senior staff attorney with the Public Health Law Center. We're also one of the partners on this project. And it has been our sincere pleasure to do this work uh, to research some of the um, transportation impacts uh, that have come as a result of the I-7585 connector. Um, as we mentioned, our research in this project is focused on the Federal Highway Act of 1956. And you may know that, that Congress approved the Federal Highway Act in 1956. And when they did that, it authorized the largest public works project at that time in US history. And so we know that this newly created highway system, um, and it's been evidenced now because we're decades beyond it, right? This particular new project routed these new highway systems directly through our black and brown communities. And in some instances, the government took homes and land by eminent domain. So what you see here is a picture of the Auburn Avenue community um, in 1958, actually. And this is what it looks like now, a similar photo, uh, just a little bit down, in 2022. And you can see just the difference in the vibrancy of the community and the businesses and the activity that was going on at that time. And that's really what we're looking to um, evaluate and to study in this particular project. I personally have lived in Atlanta for over 30 years. And as I reflect back on um, how it was when I first moved here, I can remember things like going to Thelma's for the first time, and I was like, okay, wait a minute, I'm, I'm home. I, am in, I have walked into like my grandmother's kitchen. It was amazing. And so many of those things that we, uh, that we still cherish um, are no longer here with us. So our primary question as part of the research was, how did the construction of the I-7585 connector impact the lives of residents in the Sweet Auburn community. And from the legal perspective, what we've been studying is tr past and present transportation policies at the federal, state, and local levels, as well as some regional policies, to document the impact of the timing these policies had on these changes to Sweet Auburn and to other communities. And what we're doing is we're looking at it um, across five different communities. You can see the different types of policies listed here on the screen. But in addition to Auburn Avenue, we are also looking at um, Cleveland, St. Paul, Oakland, California, and Houston, Texas, and the communities in those areas that have been impacted. Because what we're seeing is that um, those communities have been impacted similarly. The process that we're using is something called policy surveillance. And it's just really a way of saying that we're gathering, evaluating, and comparing the policies that impacted those, different, those five different communities. And so we're here today to speak to you all um, about that impact. We're excited to um, have these conversations. And as Dr. Helen mentioned, she's going to facilitate those. We'll have you all come up on the stage with us in just a moment. But we will go ahead and play. Um, a slide that talks a little bit about Sweet Auburn Lovely. Avenue as we know it. Loveliest village of the plain, where health and plenty cheered the laboring swain, where smiling spring its earliest visit paid, and parting summers lingering blooms delayed. 
Welcome to Auburn Avenue, once known as the richest African American street in the world. The Sweet Auburn Historic District stretches over one and a half miles through downtown Atlanta. Originally known as Shermantown following the Civil War Union occupation in the 19th century, Sweet Auburn began to thrive as the heart of black professional, social, and political life in Atlanta. Let's explore the rich history of this street. Atlanta Life Insurance Company, founded in 1905, is the first black-owned life insurance company in Atlanta. Owned by Alonzo Hernan, a former slave, Atlanta Life Insurance served as one of the strongest black financial institutions throughout the 20th century. At 148 Auburn Avenue, you can still find the Atlanta Life Building, the original home of the company. The Atlanta Daily World, founded in 1928, is the first black-owned daily newspaper in Atlanta, serving as a much-needed voice for blacks in Atlanta. The newspaper covered political and social topics impacting citizens, while still remaining a community staple featuring local stories and news updates. Based in the heart of the Sweet Auburn District at 145 Auburn Avenue, the Atlanta Daily World's courageous contribution to the black community of Atlanta lives on. Big Bethel African Methodist Episcopal Church was founded in 1847 and is the oldest black congregation in Atlanta. It served as a pillar in the black community of Atlanta for nearly two centuries, from hosting the first classes of Morris Brown College in its basement to serving as the first public school for blacks in Atlanta. Big Bethel has secured its place in Atlanta's history. WERD Radio first hit Airways in 1949 after owner Jesse Blayton Sr. bought the station and reimagined its programming, becoming a staple in Atlanta's black community. Housed in the Prince Hall Grand Lodge on Auburn Avenue, WERD Radio not only served as a leader in the black entertainment, but also black political progression as it broadcast Dr. Martin Luther King's Sunday morning sermons and announcements of civil engagement and protest. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was born in 1929 in Atlanta, Georgia, in the heart of the Sweet Auburn District at 501 Auburn Avenue. Dr. King's childhood home is just a short walk from the famous Ebenezer Baptist Church where both Martin Luther King Sr. and Martin Luther King Jr. shared the pulpit, bringing about hope and change for all American citizens. However, King's ties to the Sweet Auburn District doesn't stop there. As the president of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, King worked tirelessly planning countless social campaigns within the headquarters located within the Prince Hall Masonic Temple at 330 Auburn Avenue. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. greatly benefited from the vital location of the Sweet Auburn District and its development as an essential portion of black life in Atlanta. Throughout its history, the Sweet Auburn District has served as a hub for political and social organizations within the black community of Atlanta. Due to the concentration of churches, businesses, political organizations, and educational institutions present within the short one and a half mile of Auburn Avenue, a history of unprecedented growth and advancement within the black community can never be forgotten. All right. I'm going to now turn it over to Dr. Helen, and if we could ask our three uh, panel participants, if you all could come forward and have a seat here on the stage. Thank you. Yes, yes, you're in the right place? Absolutely. You were definitely in the right place. <laughs> Lovely. I was wondering, I said, oh, we have a new face in the crowd. And then, okay. 
Well, welcome everyone. And we're going to start by having the four of you introduce yourselves. Tell us a little bit about your history of Sweet Auburn. What brings you here, not just from today, however, of how you've come to be here. What has you be a part of this initiative that we're, research study that we're looking to do for the future? And Nika, since you're closest to me, why don't you begin, Ms. Nika Gilliam. Okay, my name is Nika Gilliam, um, born and raised in Atlanta, Georgia. I am a Grady baby. Um, how I'm tied to the Sweet Auburn is, could you hear me? Okay, could, I'm sorry. My name is Nika Gillum, born and raised in Atlanta, Georgia, um, literally, because I'm a Grady baby. What ties me to the Sweet Auburn is, um, my dad, him and his family is from the Sweet Auburn area. Um, down and around the time the expressway was being built. So it's kind of near and dear to my heart too, just because it affected them as well. Thank you. And followed by Nika, we have Miss Princess Wilson. Hello everyone. Now you can hear me, I think. Uh, my name is Princess Davenport Wilson. I am a Grady baby also. I was born and lived in Grady Homes, which is right before 7585 was built. I remember the day when I went to school, I, we had ad, our address was 86 Pratt Street, which is right across from Grady's emergency room now. When I came home from school that day, it was 86 Bell Street, which they've changed that name also now. But um, we had a very, a uh, positive impact from that because what they did with our building, we didn't have to get out the building. They took our six family building and they put it on tracks. And mom would always tell us that same day they were gonna move it was that they're gonna put it in track, make sure we came straight home from school so we can be inside when they put the building on tracks and moved it across the street. Nowadays we see they just tear homes down and don't do anything, but it was already always put on tracks. Then my life goes on from there, but I'm gonna pass on to Ms. Bessie right now before I get started on my life history here, which is a long time. Hello everyone, and it's great to be here today. My history goes back a long ways. Is your microphone on, Ms. Bessie Selloway? Yes. <laughs> Hello everyone. I'm happy to be here. Hopefully, I can. I can. Okay. Hopefully, I can go back into history and say something that will be worthwhile in terms of us continuing to make uh, make progress. Um, when I I was born in uh, Round Oak, Georgia, which is near Macon. And then in 1948, I think it was, my mother had moved to Atlanta, and then my brother and I were in Atlanta, uh, you know, with her. And we lived on Houston Street. I think we, it was like a one-room apartment. And my mother would go to work, and uh, she'd have to come back home. She had to ride the, uh, the streetcar, and it stopped about two blocks down from uh, where we lived. And <clears throat> The main thing is that we saw, you know, that segregation in terms of how we were treated as black people. But my mother, you know, taught us to always be respectful, to be kind, and to stand fast in what we were doing and wherever we were. Um, when I went to Our Lady of Lords uh, Catholic School, right over there near where Dr. King's home is. It's the fire station right, right there now. Um, there were times when people would just treat you bad in terms of being blacks. People would just talk and say terrible things. And of course, our parents taught us, don't get caught up in that fighting or trying to uh, get back at people when they were uh, you know, treating us wrong. And when, when, after I had lived and grown through everything and I married my husband and we went away from the Atlanta area to about what, 25 years, um, it was interesting 
to see the changes that have uh, you know, taken place. And we give thanks for all of the sacrifices that people made. And I did work with uh, Dr. King uh, three times when he was protesting, I was a, a jailbird. And even to today, my mind just relate to the things when we are living because I'll tell you a couple of incidents when I was uh, working with Dr. King. Um, I, um, okay, we were jailbirds. Uh, excuse me on that phone. We were jailbirds. For, I was a jailbird for four different times. And when I was at the prison farm, it was segregation there. All of the black ladies and guys, we had to be housed downstairs. And the white men and women were housed upstairs. Now, to punish us, in a sense, being in jail, what they did, we had to get in line, when it, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, we had to get in line and get trays of food and take it upstairs to the white persons. And then after we finished serving them, you know, we could eat. Now, just think about that. Well, that, that was, that's actually, you know, what, what happened. And there were m many other incidents. But when the movement, Dr. King's movement was over, I had some experiences that I remember to this day. Uh, when we, before uh, the changes, black people, if you went to uh, Fox, the Fox Theater, you had to sit upstairs in the balcony, all the way upstairs. Well, anyway, uh, integration had happened, and I went to the theater. And when I went to the theater that day, uh, and after the movie was over, I came home. So I got on the bus, but I had to change buses at Little Five Point in order to, you know, to go to my house. And I sat down beside this man, and then when I sat down beside him, he took his fist and he beat on that pole, you know, like if you stand, he beat on the pole and he beat on the pole. And I always loved umbrellas, and I carried them around, and I had an umbrella. So I said, dear Lord, I've been to jail with Dr. King and the movement. I said, if this man hit me today, I'm going to wear him out with that umbrella. <laughs> well, he didn't, wear, he didn't hit me, so when I got down there and, and changed buses, I was just so, so happy and thankful about that. But two other incidents. I got on the bus down on Auburn Avenue, and I sat down beside this man. And he decided that he would step over me because he was upset, you know, me, a black woman sitting down beside him. Then a second time I was on the bus and something happened. I sat down beside this man and that man took his backside, his butt side and swept me off the, off the seat. And I caught the pole in order not to, you know, fall flat on the floor. So I told the bus driver and he says to me, I don't have eyes in the back of my head. Well, there are some many things going on, and today I just like to give thanks and praise to God for everybody who played a part in, in a, a mission in terms of breaking up just outright segregation. But we already know that many people, it all depends on personal heart as to whether they accept us as blacks or accept other people. So we give thanks, and I feel we still have a lot to do because there's so much Segregation now, still. A lying, cheating, stealing, and falsifying. So we, we must stay forward to do all that we can do so righteousness will prevail. Jesus Christ died so we could have the righteousness of him because we don't have any of our own. And we do know that we must pray and we must love. And love has to cover up a whole lot of things that are going on today. Thank you. Miss Bessie. We'll now hear from Mr. Devin Lee Woodson. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Devin Lee Woodson. Um, thank you for having me here. Thank you. Um, I'm, a, I'm the owner of Powell's Lounge. It's located at 254 Auburn Avenue. It's a fourth generation bar and entertainment place. Um, first run by my grandmother, so I grew up on Auburn Avenue and started by my great-grandfather, Robert Lee Murray. Currently, I'm also the president of Fourth in Sand. Um, that's the Sweet Auburn Neighborhood District, so that's kind of this area, and then Edgewood and um, that, that area, and then beyond, behind there. The reason I'm here is, you know, my family has been here. Um, 
This neighborhood is um, dear to my heart. Um, the, uh, my business is dear to my heart. Um, the building that my family you know, sacrificed and bought and passed down is dear to my heart. And um, the history has been repeating itself. You know, these um, transportation initiatives, you know, the first streetcar, then, then um, uh, um, the 7585 overpass, now most recently the next streetcar edition. So this is a repeated um, effort um, by the city to bring transportation initiatives through black communities. And I'm just really excited to, you know, just shed more light on, on the experience that it's had on the community from then to now. And so thank you. Well, we thank each and every one of you for your stories. And as I start out saying, there's a history here. There's a storyline. And it changes with the generations and the impact that it has. We want to start out asking a question. What do you remember about the decision to build the downtown connector through Sweet Auburn? Anyone? Well, um, well, we, it, I think it, it happened around 1955 or 56. I was only about seven years old then. And uh, we didn't have a say-so as to what we were doing, what my parents had to do. Um, but we were just told, you have to stay in. They gave us a date and time that when they were going to actually move the building over on the tracks, nobody had to move out or anything. But the... I don't remember any, my parents were very docile, you know, being black, and they didn't really go into saying too much of anything. So they were happy just to go along with the program. I also went to Our Lady of Lourdes Catholic School up on, so I just, we did just walk up to school and come back every day, and, uh, but they knew not to exploit anything or say anything about it as to whether they agreed with it or not that didn't come into play, even when they started integrating the Catholic schools there, which I integrated the first year in 62. But when they moved our building over, you know, we were satisfied because they still moved it to Bell Street and uh, we still had a playground. And then when I started researching this years later as to why they really, did they really do that? Do I remember this really happening? My mom had agreed, said, yeah, we really did. They moved out, they put on tracks and moved just across the street. But it wasn't, um, it wasn't a hard thing to get used to except for when integration started. Because when you read about it online, it, sell, it talks about the black ghettos and how the poor people lived. We never thought of ourselves as being poor or it was a ghetto. It was where we lived. It was a community. We all lived together. We knew each, everybody in the projects, and we all went different ways to school. But I never had an inkling about how you were supposed to feel about it. The government said you had to do it. We did it. We didn't know how to, at least my parents didn't know how to argue. And I, maybe that's why I've grown up to be an activist the way I am now. But for me, it didn't have too much of an impact. Um. I can give some feedback on that. Um, me speaking with my dad about it, and he was sharing um, his parents' thoughts about the expressway. They didn't have a, a say so or a thought about it until it was done. They didn't realize it affected them until after um, it cut up between a space that they could actually walk through to get downtown or to get over to an area where they can buy shoes or pay for their life insurance. They didn't realize that until after the fact of, in order for them to get the necessities they need, groceries and shoes and pay their life insurance or whatever it was on the other side of what was a, a space that became an expressway. They didn't realize that until they had to walk the long way. So they didn't realize that it was running through shoes more until, you know, my dad being um, one of the males of the family, he was a baby of course, but his big brother and his um, older cousins had to walk downtown to, to get things that their parents needed at that time 
or get on a bike and ride, but with them walking, they ran through shoes even more. So like he said, back in those days, you get your Sunday shoes, you got your school shoes, and then you got your play shoes. So when you get a new pair of Sunday shoes, those become your school shoes, and then your school shoes become your play shoes. So they had different pairs of play shoes more often than usual because of the, such a long walk, and that's when they realized, hey, this is kind of inconvenient in us. But they didn't complain because they were still just grateful to not be displaced. So they didn't look at it as an inconvenient at that time. That's interesting when you talk about to not be displaced. But clearly, were there people who were displaced in the process of the downtown connector? I'm not sure if it was because, um, you know, and this is my thought, if it doesn't happen to you directly, sometimes you look at it like it's not really happening. So if, um, like Ms. Princess said, they didn't get this place. They built and got on rails and was able to be pushed across the street, pushed wherever. And at that time, they didn't look at it like somebody was displacing them because in actuality, you was being displaced. That wasn't your address anymore. Your mom knew where she wanted to live at the time she moved there. She didn't say, I'm going to move here, and then you know, a few years later, we're going to move across the street. But it changed. So for the convenience of that expressway, as long as you wasn't homeless in the process or they didn't put a burden on you that you can see, I don't think people really looked at it. But I do think some people were displaced because in order to build that expressway, it had to be some things there that had to be removed like Miss Princess, them, they built and got rolled out of the way to make way for the expressway. So I think people were displaced. They just didn't know it, they didn't have the knowledge. When well, you oh, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead, Princess. Well, what I was gonna um, piggyback on what you're saying is um, displacing, we were comfortable when, when we moved, they moved our building to Bell Street, but what happened around 1957 or 58, the government got the black veterans all and decided they can move out the projects and they created a whole new subdivision in Atlanta. Uh, it was only, now I see it was only five miles outside of downtown Atlanta, but it turned out to be, um, it was only, well we thought it was, we thought it was, we were going out to the country, but it was really only five miles, which created, that's how Thomasville subdivision started. They had a street, they, made, they built two streets out there for black veterans to go out there that had no lights. Some of the streets weren't even paved. And that was one way of them getting some of the black veterans out of the projects and putting them into homes. They can buy individual homes, which my dad bought for $5,000 over there. But uh, that's the only displacement. And, and of course, our parent, my parents had nothing didn't say, have a say so in it. They just accepted it as being a homeowner then, so. Let's talk about environmental changes from the policy of transportation from the 1950s. How has Sweet Auburn changed since they built the downtown connector? And I want you to think about, we've talked on housing in the neighborhood, but jobs, air quality, commerce, Devin, you talk about a fourth generation business. How have these things been impacted because of the downtown connector? Mm -hmm. Well, um, the downtown connector um, in its inception came about um, a little bit before I was alive, mm -hmm. but um, the effects of it are still there. Um, Powell's, um, the business that my family owns, it sits on the corner of Auburn and Bell Street. And then, um, which was um, also referred to, um, Thel Thelma's Rib Shack uh, was, on the, was on the other end, and that's actually um, the family of a friend of mine, and we all grew up together, we went to uh, school and stuff. And um, what I can see is, um, you know, when you remove um, a, a, a block full of businesses, um, a block full of uh, uh, incomes, for families, um, a block full of um, community, then it has a huge effect on the, um, 
socially and psychologically on the neighborhood. Um, and and I, I can even say this, um, even in recent times, um, with the streetcar initiative um, that they just did, you know, recently, um, the, the, there's the, um, the construction portion of it is, is one portion of it that you have to survive. And then if somehow you survive the construction portion of it, which is the displacement, what you're left with is um, a community that's been partially destroyed and kind of has to regain a new identity. Because you can't, you can't really displace a, a, a good amount of the community without people being like, okay, am I next? What am I gonna do next? Um, and so, even in the recent transportation initiatives, when they did, when they did um, the streetcar, I couldn't cross the street for my business for a year. I couldn't walk across the street. Mm -hmm. So um, when we think about, you know, if you're putting a 75, 85 highway directly through the center of Auburn Avenue, when the people have to walk from this direction to the other direction, now you probably have to walk, you know, there, there's, there, there's that sort of thing and you know, it, it's, it's um, a community has to survive through these things. And so I know um, just in, w with my family, um, part of surviving is figuring out, well, what is the city deciding to do? What are they, you know, and what is my voice worth in that? And so I feel like um, when these huge projects come in, and they often do that in black communities, they come in and they roll right through the middle of black community, especially places that are thriving. Um, we're always um, the most impacted, and we're, we're always the ones who um, uh, psychologically go through it and then have to be the ones to find a way to survive. Um, and that seems to be the case even with Auburn Avenue. Um, People go from living in a community, and then you you take you take um, um, ownership and businesses out of the community, even if it's just a portion of them, and you kind of either replace them with no community or replace them with renters, uh, you know, a, a renting scenario. And not I'm not saying that um, a community is is made up the, of the diaspora of ownership, renters, commercial and those sort of things, but over time, it seems that the um, Auburn Avenue community has just been replaced from the black ownership. And it's just something about um, when, when we have a community that we own and that we build, um, it's, there's a different care that goes along with it and that's put into it. And right now, it's as if we've transitioned from ownership to renting, mm. and psychologically, that had that has a huge effect on um, the neighborhood, more, a more transient neighborhood, um, as opposed to a neighborhood fixed in generations and you know traditions of generations and families in, in generations, and I, so I, so I see it as having a, a, a huge effect, um, and mostly um, a. a a bad effect as a whole. I mean, I'm not, you know, again, I can't speak for the personal experience of, you know, going through that particular construction initiative, but looking back, you know, having a, with my family and kind of talking to them, and then even the shared experience that I've had in, in growing up down here and watching the community kind of um, deteriorate, you know, that's, that, that's been, that's, that's my experience. That's an interesting point you make. I want to lift up out of that. You had business owners that went from owning real estate of thriving businesses, displaced and replaced with someone else building something in the aftermath that now business owners rented the space. They didn't own it. How did that impact the quality of the stores or the, the interest of the stores in serving the community? When, when I hear that, I'm, I think about corner stores that see themselves as a catch-all, we're gonna have anything and everything you want without being allegiant to, like your family. You knew, your family knew what they were doing, what they were good at, what 
gave them pride in adding value to the community. How has that changed in Sweet Auburn over the years? Um, well, or anyone? Yes, but well, go ahead, Deb. Well, no, I mean, please. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll, um, well, um, <clears throat> I think that um, when 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 you already have a foundation of where you come from, then it gives you a roadmap. So <clears throat> often, oftentimes, you know, um, part of generational wealth um, is is not just um, uh, monetarily, but it's somebody created a roadmap in, in a way for you to go forward. And so you can see it, you know, whereas um, I feel like the, the consequences of things are, you know, pull your own self up by your bootstraps, you know, and each generation having to do that over time is, is, is not is just not normal in terms of how a community can sustain and thrive. And, um, and so it creates an environment where it's about um, you yourself. It, it creates an environment where it's about your own personal feelings as opposed to collectively what has happened to us. Collectively, where are we going? Yes, we have individual gripes and things, but it's really the collective um, community of Sweet Auburn that really made the change throughout the world. I mean, you know, and you can just see this. I mean, I've, I've, you travel all over the world, people might not really understand the name of Sweet Auburn, but everybody understands the legacy of Martin Luther King, the legacy of the Civil Rights Movement, the legacy of protests, the legacy of black liberation. Everybody understands that. Um, and so, you know, I, I think um, it's just important that, um, you know, we highlight our collective nature and the power of our collective nature. And I, I feel like, you know, when you have scenarios like this where um, the community is, is, is parceled off, you know, and you're like, uh, okay, if you can survive this, then you can stay. That's often, you know, it, it's, it's been, it was great that your family, you know, they put the house on, on some wheels and pushed it across the street. I mean, that's, I can't even imagine that happening at this point in time because, you know, it, even in my lifetime, you go up the street and, you know, the new Renaissance walk building, that was a whole nother thing. You know, that they, they built, you know, and so they displaced blocks and blocks of, of things for, um, you know, new real estate that to me is not, um, is not reflecting the, the, the togetherness of, that the community was. Well, it wasn't built by the community. Yeah. It didn't necessarily say what are the needs of the community if we're going to build something. Right. It said here's some real estate that we can purchase and build what we want to build. And, and, and that leads into how has the way the neighborhood changed impacted health, the health of your family, doctors? I mean, I think about a community. You've got doctor's offices and places that see children and infants or some place to go for urgent care, uh, the, the, the modern day terminology that maybe it wasn't a full-fledged hospital but a place you could go in between. How has that changed? Um, coming from a community aspect, I didn't live in the Sweet Auburn area but I did um, go to the Sweet Auburn area for a whole lot of things. Um, I remember being a child living not too far from there in Summer Hill, and that's walkable range at that time, back in the 80s, early 90s, walkable range to get down to the current market. We call it the current market. Some people who are not from here, they call it the municipal market. But to get to the current market, to get the fresh fruits, veggies, your, your carver's meat, that you need to get um, a certain amount of so that you don't have to go in the grocery store and just get the packages of it, get family packs. Who, who's to say what my family size is? So I remember going down there with my mom. I remember going to Hugh Spalding. Everybody now calls it CHOA, Children's Healthcare mm -hmm. of Atlanta. But I remember Hugh Spalding. I remember the McDonald's that sat on the side of Grady. I remember Church's Chicken that sat beside Ebenezer Baptist Church after we do the Martin Luther King March. 
And at the end of it, we wound up at Ebenezer Baptist Church. Everybody go to that church just to get something to eat because it was affordable. I even can go where I remember getting ready for school, like around now. We would be at Samberley's, which was um, near Powell's Lounge, to get our hair did at the beauty college because that was a black beauty college where a lot of the black people from the community in and around the Sweet Auburn area would go to learn how to do hair, but in exchange learn how to do hair, it was a set amount, $10 to get your hair curled, 15 to get it permed, and you know, five or six dollars to get the boys hair cut. So that was affordable and it was in walkable range because the Sweet Auburn is the middle of Atlanta, if you look at it, because it's, it's surrounded by Great Home, it's surrounded by Mechanicsville, some hill, and some of the other, um, neighborhoods that's around. And I call it neighborhoods, some people call them hoods. But to me, it's a community and it's a neighborhood because I live in a Pittsburgh um, community as of now. But I really remember it affecting the community members, which I was one, that um, as things started to change down on Auburn Avenue, healthcare, places, doctor's office, insurance offices, um, funeral homes, a lot of people use the funeral home down next to the um, Masonic Lodge. So I, Huckabrooks, right, I remember that. And, and in fact, now I rolled down that way and I didn't realize that that building almost looked like it's deteriorating. It's something that I, I can't remember what was beside it, but I'm for sure it was a store because that's the area we used to stand in front of when we watched the parade before we started being a part of the Martin Luther King Parade. So it mar we marched up through that way for a reason. Dr. King came up through that area for a reason because it was central for the community members not to make it a, a hassle or to make it a, a um, disparity for them to get to what they need to get to or to hear what they need to hear as far as segregated things being desegregated as it was going. So I do know it did affect the community members because it affected me as a child. I just want to add on that. Um, by living in Grady Homes also, and the expressway came through, it was hard to get over to, you had to go around to get to Auburn. And also, there was another famous street, Forest Avenue, which my dad had a shoe shop there on Forest Avenue. And um, right there at Buttermilk Bottom, which there was a lot of stuff. and. My dad, we was talking about tobacco earlier, and he was an avid smoker living who we moved, of course, over to. And that's what a lot of people in the black community was doing in some of the um, establishment, the businesses on Forest Avenue, that um, they were all smokers. Everybody on that street was smokers. So um, I remember that and how it affected the health of him and also other, um, business owners over there. But uh, coming back to, back over to Grady Homes and the way we had to get food insecurity was the curb market. And it's amazing that when I remember as a little girl going into the curb market and uh, wanted just to uh, look at the water fountain, get some water, they had a colored water fountain and a white water fountain. And me and my friends would run in there and we would have to try the white water to see if that was as good as that colored water in there. And as soon as somebody would notice us in there, we would run back out, back up the street, up Bell Street, and uh, go from there. But my life has really done a full circle of where I started from. And I'm 75, so I've got a whole new circle around, around different places, trying to go to different cities also. But uh, I ended up right back where I started. Um, and I, I just wanted to um, kind of add on to what you all were saying, um, like the health of the community and how, um, just how a, com a thriving community gives their constituents options um, and that the 75-85 um, um, construction initiative and the things that have happened to the community have taken away property you know, individual property, but also collective property. For instance, um, across the street from Powell's, um, there's, um, well, right next to Powell's, there's the Oddfellows building. 
um, the Odd Fellows Building, you know, there it's in a transition right now. But the Odd Fellows Building was a thriving place for black businesses, for, for people to go in and, and, and um, you know, get services. Across the street from the Odd Fellows Building, um, if there's a now a, 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 a vacant lot that was also a, a, a thriving community business. Um, was it the um, the Rutgers building? Her Herndon building. Herndon building. Um, thank you. Appreciate it, uh, uh, And um, and that was also a um, you know a, a thriving commercial um, business. And so w when you when you take these things out of a community, it's like where are people supposed to go? It's that simple. Where, you know, you, have, you, need the di you need the different types of businesses. You need the doctor's offices, the dentist offices, the, you know, the insurance places. You can't just have you know, a nightclub, you know, which is, you know, we, 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 we have an entertainment district. Auburn has been known as an entertainment district, but it was known as a community where people lived. Restaurants, you know, shoes you know, drugstores. Full of black owned businesses exactly. that black people patronize. So right. when you think about generational wealth, how is that created? The downtown connector didn't take any of that into consideration of what they were taking away and that begs the question, in place of what? What is that what that in some way sparked a decline of the richness of the Sweet Auburn community. And if anyone in the audience has something they'd love to share, we'd love to hear from you. Because that's what we're here, to hear for, from you and your experiences as we look at what does that mean going forward from vacant lots to buildings not serving the interests of the community, but taking advantage of the real estate what does that mean to that sense of community, to that overall health? Because now we're talking about that health that drives the stressors of life, whether it's smoking or alcoholism or just depression, mental health issues that when you get one, it tends to invite another and another, and it almost acts like a virus within the community. Your thoughts? Well, I mean, I know that um, even when you're looking at the experience of where Auburn is right now, um, I can remember people, and, they, and I see them right now, the same people who I see that had jobs before in the community kind of walked around and, you know what I mean, um, um, had, had thriving lives are kind of in disrepair now and homeless in the same community. And it's, it's like, why, why is that the case? Why is, why, is, why is that the experience of so many of the people who um, I saw as a child growing up, why are they now homeless in the same community that they used to thrive in? Um, it's not, you know, it's not just because they've just made some bad decisions. You know, it's like, what's going on with the environment that is pushing you know, pushing the constituents in the society to straight survival mode and then beyond that. If you could write the script for what Sweet Auburn would look like five years, 10 years, 20 years from now, what would you want to see Sweet Auburn become? Probably back to kind of back to what it was um, when buildings was full of businesses, not just regular businesses, but um, maybe majority black businesses. I'm not gonna necessarily say we don't want other people in, that would be selfish of us, but majority black businesses that we can use, not necessarily putting things down there that we don't use or that we cannot afford, make it more affordable for the community um, business owners and not business renters, as Mr. Woodson said, because um, when you rent it, renting things, inflation is happening. So we can't expect 
things to be reasonable when you got to pay a low boatload of money just to rent something. So that's one of the reasons that things are so expensive as well. And I get it. I, I totally get it. But um, bring black back Black Wall Street again down in Sweet Auburn. Create jobs for people that look like us and for um, people that thrive like us and need things. So the networking piece, I think that should be back in, in place, not just for, you know, unnecessary businesses, but Powell's Lounge, and I do want to say this, so, um, Mr. Woodson, Powell's Lounge is, is amazing. Um, I know whenever we're at Grady, because Grady is the hospital, my family's choice, especially if, if we're going through something really deep, you know, family in the hospital, other family members coming in to pray and sit around and support. Powell Lounge has been like an outlet for, hey, you've been down here two or three days, get away. And the crowd of the family just come and everybody walk down to Powell's Lounge just to, you know, get your head away from what is really going on with your family member or what have you. So Powell's Lounge is, is in a perfect place and it is amazing to the community. And I appreciate y'all keep thriving and keep trying to be there. So five, 10 years, I will imagine Powell's Lounge being there and them possibly giving them a grant to expand so that they can get many people as they need in there. So something like that. I think we also need some healthy options for new businesses coming in. We need something that's going to help our community, not a side store, a little nickel and dime store that sells cigarettes and lottery tickets and soft drinks and so forth, but to um, just open something up where there are other options for us to eat besides fried foods and um, just, we just need some more options that will help our community. We don't need any more church's chickens. We don't need any more, uh, Popeyes is okay, but they need to, they need to get us, stay out of our community. We need to cut down on some of the liquor stores. I mean, we can have beer and wine, so, but when you have a predominantly, a predominant neighborhood that only has fried chicken and liquor stores, there's a problem with that, with us in living longer lives and living more productive lives. And healthier lives. Ms. Bessie. Yes. I've just been pondering everything that has been said, and in light of Sweet Auburn Avenue continuing to grow, analyzing the history, and concerned about the future, perhaps we need to figure out a way to come up with a, a agency. It's like you have a Red Cross and you have all these other things. We need to come up with uh, uh, help me ask, but we need to come up with a, a, a contact or a business that will work on taking care of all of these things that we are discussing, all the things that we are concerned about, and in pres preserving uh, Sweet Auburn Avenue and yet making progress, you know, for the future. You know, except uh, uh, in this room here, you know, but this room to be cleaned all the time, and we have different reasons, you gotta have somebody to do that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, just like you take care of babies, all right, we wanna have a care for Sweet Auburn Avenue. So we need to come up with an organization that will go on and on and on, like the Red Cross or whatever, to take care and to come up with what we need to preserve it and for Sweet Auburn Avenue to always be a place of outreach, of comfort, protection, safety, education, you know, for our young people. So, so we do have an um, organization that does it. Okay. It came around the time that Maynard Jackson, Maynard Jackson was in office. It's called the NPU okay. Neighborhood Planning Unit. So maybe. It, it's some type of supplemental organization that can cling on to the NPU yes. that can focus 
specifically on what you're talking about? Because I get what you're saying. Maybe an advisory board. It can be like a, a community um, business owner advisory board yeah. that you can possibly present to the NPU of this community. I think the community collaborative is a great place to start where you all are. This rich history of what was to where you'd like it to go and partnering with the MPUs, the two of them that overlap, Sweet Auburn, wouldn't it be wonderful that as you look to others in the community, there's strength in numbers. Each one reach one. It's about community, talking to your neighbor. I remember when. Wouldn't it be nice if we had? What will it take for us to get? Dare to dream. Well, I mean, I know I, looking out in the audience, uh, my brother sitting over there in the corner, he hasn't, he hasn't said anything, but he does quite a bit for the community. Um, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna Please go come I'm share gonna, your I'm story. Gonna you I'm, gonna put you, I'm gonna put you on the spot, you know what I'm saying? Because no, you, no you're, you're, he's, Good. He's always one, Please uh, come he and speak from the mic. Working in the community. Yes, because we're recording. Yeah, but this is really about yeah. research and being able to, I think you have to come up this way. I don't think it's going to come, but so far. Come to the stage and grab my mic. Yes, tell us your name and yeah. you might have to stand. I don't think it's going to reach that far. Oh, maybe. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Leonel Varnell. Um, uh, I'm a resident of the Old Fourth Ward, just north of Sweet Auburn. I live on Forest Avenue, uh, which they've renamed Ralph McGill, thankfully, because it used to be named after Nathaniel Bedford Forrest, the uh, gentleman who is singularly responsible for reinvigorating the Ku Klux Klan in the city. Um, there's a lot to talk about. Mm -hmm. I love this notion of health, and I love, the, I love the fact that we haven't spent a lot of time thinking about heightened temperatures of this neighborhood because of the infrastructure, heightened CO2, but rather we're talking about more mental harm and the health, the negative health that goes along with, um, I'll, I'll counter one thing you said, with someone intentionally removing wealth and resident from this neighborhood. The highway didn't have to make a left to come through our neighborhood. They did that intentionally. And they knew that they would be removing people, families, churches. If Bobby were here, he'd tell you how his family's church was, was removed um, and they had to relocate on Jackson Street. Um, and when you, to Devin's earlier point, when you extract that from a community, it leaves, there's a hole, there's a loss. There's a mental toll that it takes. And Which I, impacts the physicality of your body. 100%. And I think there's a massive uh, health component in if we think about remediation and trying to repair that harm on a go forward basis, we're aware that um, the Department of Transportation with Buddha Judge has, a, has, uh, has capital available through the Reconnecting Communities Act. and. They're trying to mitigate against the negative effects of all these highways and all these black neighborhoods and all these states in this country. Um, I think we need to press a broader conversation as we talk about repair, that some of the repair is definitely physical and wealth, but a lot of the repair also happens, has to deal with black health, negative black health outcomes that are often mental um, in nature because of the, the extraction of people and wealth from our community. You don't want me talking. But yeah, no, no, that's why we're here. It's not about us talking. There's a saying, you don't ask the doctor if the medicine is working, you ask the patient. We're talking about Sweet Auburn community. Please, anyone else, do you have something to share of your experience? What brings you here today to even, whether it's just straight curiosity, to want to Here's something to, to share, because in order to move forward, it takes this community with a desire and a passion to see more, better, healthier, different, 
You know what that looks like. You don't have to necessarily have been here when the downtown connector was constructed, but you live in the shadows of it and the impact it has had on your community. We're here to support you, and we've identified cities across this country that have similar stories to tell. As black people, we are storytellers. Before we knew how to read and write, we told stories. Passed down. Devin, I love that you're here, fourth generation of a family that has been anchored here in this community and the shoulders upon which you stand. What does that do for you in terms of where Sweet Auburn can go? <clears throat> well, um, what I, kind of what I was touching on earlier is when you um, have seen survival, then you can draw on that inspiration, that ancestral, in, that ancestral um, connection. And so Auburn Avenue is that sort of environment. Even the building of PALS is that sort of environment. People have been congregating in that buildings for so many generations. It, the building itself is, ha is alive. You know, it has a feeling of, um, you know, it, it, in, in lack of a better, t it, it like talks to me. You know, maybe not with words, but with feelings. Like I feel like there, there's a level, element of protection that, that, that is around it and that I feel within the community. And because I have that feeling, then there's a, I feel empowered. And when you feel empowered, then you will do the extra things. You will take the extra time to say what's wrong. How can we fix this? How, how can I be a better person myself? What can I do? Um, with, the, with the tools that I have myself to change my current situation, which maybe can help go, you know, help the neighbor, help the person down the street. Um, so even the trajectory of the neighborhood, for me, um, Auburn Avenue has, for the past recent times, um, really existed, I mean, I'm not saying that it, it doesn't have a day life, but it, it, it has existed in the realm of, of a night life. Um, the, it seems like the day, the daytime um, community has just been extracted. You know, you have, obviously you have um, businesses surviving, but to me the future of, of, of Auburn is bringing the community back to the mornings. You know, you, walk, you can walk out your house and, you know, there's, there's activity, there, there are, there's um, children and families traversing up and down the street. People are feeling comfortable to do that. Um, it's not, you know, a, a, a fight between, you know, uh, um, you know, you feeling safe, you feeling like, oh, okay, well, do I need to, you know, do I need to help eradicate the homeless scenario that's in the neighborhood that you know is just around me? You know, all of these issues that we're having um, are, are issues in every community. It's not like uh, Auburn is the only community where you know we, there's a drug infestation, there's a homeless infestation. You know, there's uh, buildings aren't um, um, uh, um, kept kept up the way they need to be kept up. But to me, the future of it is really finding that, that, that community of what it's gonna be now, and then also civic engagement. It's like, part of the, I grew up on Auburn, and I'm in, recently in my life involved in, this, in, in the, the civic side of it, you know, the neighborhood side of it. And that just came as a result of the environment just breaking down around me and then just um, getting with people in the community who care about the community and just being like, okay, well, what's going on here? What organizations do we have? What things exist? How do we get involved with those organizations? What tools exist for us to have a voice? Um, I think part of, part of that is, is, is really missing from the community. You know, we have meetings about 
construction projects coming into the community. There's multi-million dollar you know, uh, 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 companies you know, investing in the community, but the people who are here have no idea what's going on. And the people who are here have almost no idea on how to get involved. You know? And so I think that the future is going to involve knowledge. You know, um, education, understanding, understanding where we are, and you know, understanding where we want to go. Regardless of where we want to go, we still have to go there. We still have to understand. And and you know, when you read things, and you know, you were around in the movement, you there's strategic planning that that is implemented so that we can do things like. You know, Sweet Auburn Works. I mean, they deal in 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 in, um, in neighborhood preservation. They're an institution where they are methodically looking at what's happening with the neighborhood and trying to find solutions. The entire neighborhood has to be involved in that, from the children to the elders, and everybody should have a say. Everybody should have a voice, um, and that's really the future to me. I just want to say to the audience that there are opportunities. We're building a movement with the community collaborative that these four persons have said, yes, I want to be a part. Margaret Mead once said, it's usually a handful of people that make a commitment to change always has been, and it probably always will be. That's the seed. How will you step in to help that seed to grow into a movement to shift Sweet Auburn community for future generations? It's a question that we can ask in almost every black urban community across this nation. And we don't have another lifetime to wait. The time is now. The Civil Rights Movement, one of the most striking things about that movement that many people lose sight of is that there were young soldiers on the front line with the energy, the desire to dare to dream of something better. Who here now feels like I want something better than what I've got? I hope it's what's driven you to show up here today. I think on some level we all want that. I don't know a parent that doesn't want better for their children. But it begins with a few people willing to say, this is what I can bring to help make that happen. Information, knowledge is powerful. However, its power lies in the ability for people to get engaged and make it so. And we're inviting you to join this collaborative for the community. We'll be meeting here next, not here literally, but we'll be meeting on the 17th of August. And we'll be sure to let you know, make sure you signed in. Are there any questions about what we've shared, what we've discussed, any comments? Because we want to report back no, yes. We want to report back yes. There is a desire and an interest in Sweet Auburn to do what we can do that no one else can do because it's your community. To build momentum, to find others to share your stories. We are people of telling stories. Haven't you heard some wonderful stories here today? Have you learned something about this community that you didn't know existed before? Maybe you heard wind of it, and now this confirmation, oh, yes, I've heard something about that before. 
We want to thank you for taking time to join us today. And before we leave, I'd love for our panelists to share one vision of a revived Sweet Auburn that you'd like to see have happen. More open businesses for um, people of color. More, say that again. More open businesses for people of color. I think we should get more of the young generation involved with the community. Uh, the elders have been taking it over for a while, but I think it's time to get the younger generation involved. Let them, let's, let's listen to what they're saying and let's follow their lead on certain aspects, but because they're very smart, they're coming out very smart. So I think we need to let pass our torch on to our younger generation and see what they offer for us. And in light of that, I, I think it will be very important as we have met here today. So when we think about the entire community, we need to be known and have times where the majority can choose to come and participate. And then we have the ideas or we have the uh, programs what, you know, uh, change what we want to do for the future, then they can be involved with their gifts and talents and ability and awareness. Um, I'd like to see um, in the community healthy food. Um, I feel like um, any thriving community needs nutrition, you know, needs nutrients. I'd like to see more, you know, uh, urban farming, it, you know, farm to table businesses. Um, you know, I think if, if we're not healthy, then we can't, we can't really do anything. And so I, I think that um, that piece in the community um, in the future would, would be amazing, especially for young people and, you know, get, you know food. Nutritious food, not just, you know. Our physical health and our mental health are the true path to wealth. Paraphrasing a comment I heard from Oprah Winfrey, our greatest wealth lies within our health. And when we begin to do better at taking care of our health, we position ourselves to increase the wealth in our communities. We thank you all for joining us today for this listening campaign for the Sweet Auburn community. And this is only the beginning. It will continue. Yes. I am yeah, a, I'm, the, I'm the neighborhood association yeah. president. Okay. And I've been on boards of uh, quite a few of them, <laughs> different times. So yeah, I'm kind of worn out a little bit. But uh, <laughs> that's why I wanted to get the younger generation <laughs> up and coming, because I have been involved quite a bit. NPU, M, and uh, Fort Worth Alliance, or Fort Worth. I'm in the community. They know me. It's time to pass the baton to do a new thing. Any other questions, comments?
and we would love to have you be a part of it. Please, please speak with us afterwards. Okay. Any other questions, comments from our audience? Perhaps in the future, maybe two years from now, we can have a Sweet Auburn Avenue Community Parade. Start downtown, start all down to Auburn Avenue. And it would be uh, advertising and um, speaking to the community as to you know who we are, what we do, and uh, displaying our showing off our progress. You know, what we've got so meeting, being a part of one another, and just growing. Do Pilates come back? Okay. I've never seen it down all the way. Well, why don't we give a big round of applause to our panelists today. These are the members. All couldn't make it today. We hope to have them all at the next convening on August 17th. Please mark your calendar. Uh, be on the lookout for the location that will be coming out soon. Thank you. And have a wonderful and cool, as best we can, evening. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>